we have Vinod Sir taking his class on organizing palliative care. So thank you all for joining in. We can start with Sir's presentation, followed it, followed by its discussion and feedback. So over to Sunil Sir. So till now we were talking about uh, symptom control and psychological aspect, communication, all those things. Now we are moving on to how to organize a palliative care. What all needs to be careful while we uh, need to start a palliative care? What is the role of uh, volunteer? Uh, what is the role of communi community? So we just uh, very important part in palliative care. So this will be handled by Dr. Uh, Bino, Mr. Binod Hariran. Uh, basically, he is an engineering graduate and uh, uh, he is um, MD of uh, two companies. But uh, he was actively involved in the formation of Palium India, and uh, he is he is one of the trustees now of Palium India. And um, we'll, uh, welcome, uh, Binod. Thank you, Dr. Sinel. That's a lovely interview. And uh, how many of us are here uh, for this session? Um, I can see seven. Is that the total number? Uh, sir, five of them have joined in, sir. Five doctors. Okay. <clears throat> how, many are how many more are expected? Uh, around six will be joining in shortly, sir. Sir, you can start, sir. They will be joining in. So, <clears throat> sorry. Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, in fact, sorry. Um, I'm Binod, and as uh, Dr. Sunil said, I'm not a doctor, I'm basically an engineer. So that, delay, that uh, I, I believe raises a few eyebrows. You know, what, what is this guy doing here, you know? <laughs> What right has he got to talk about palliative care? So we'll um, um, we'll go through that. Um, I believe all of you are doctors, right? Uh, Raju, all the participants are doctors, right? All are doctors. Sir. Fantastic, very good. So now. <laughs> I just, <clears throat> I just want, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Yeah. I just want to know how many of you come from um, some kind of palliative care background? I mean, uh, how many of you already work in institutions where there is some kind of palliative care activity going on? Um, you can just raise your hands or or put it in the chat, whichever is convenient for you. Am I audible to any, everyone? Yes, you are audible. So is there, department is there, Dr. Shobha, okay. Okay, good to know that. So there is only one doctor here who comes from an institution where there is at least a department of palliative care. Now that is good to know. Um, now we know what we are working against now because uh, there is hardly any palliative care facility in most parts of the country. And as doctors, as uh, physicians, um, you know, working to alleviate the pain and suffering of millions in this country. It's, um, it's unfortunate that many of the institutions where you are currently working, they don't have a palliative care facility or any background in palliative care. So <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm happy to know that at least you have taken the initiative of trying to know something more about palliative care. Um, and let us let us see. I mean, obviously, it's going to be a huge challenge for each one of you going forward because there is no palliative care currently being offered from your institutions. You're probably going to be the what you call the champions in your own institutions or in your own areas. Now that I believe is why it's relevant 
um, you know, to, to know a bit about organizing palliative care, apart from um, knowing about how to treat a patient and how to offer the kind of palliative care support and service to, to the, the community and the patients and the families. Now, if you look, if, when, we, when we have these interactions uh, in our uh, facility with, with doctors from different parts of the country, um, especially as part of our uh, uh, CCP and the certificate course in palliative medicine that we conduct, we often um, find that once the doctors go through all this uh, palliative care training, I mean, the technical part of it is covered. You learn a lot about um, communication skills, how to interact with the patient, what to say, what not to say, um, how to approach an end of life situation, what medicines to give, what, medic what not to be given, and all those things, you know, you're quite familiar with those things already because I believe this is the last session and uh, you've covered all of that. Now, the remaining questions are always around, you know, okay, I know all these things, but how do I put it to practice? What do I do with this knowledge that I've gained? Because unfortunately, um, as we see, you know, since we, don't have palliative care being offered from many institutions. There is no team currently in place which is looking at delivering this care. There is no infrastructure support that the required infrastructure support most often. We don't even have the, the right kind of medicines also to take care of certain situations. Now, so that is why, you know, the questions are always around, you know, how do I go about using it? How do I uh, um, uh, use this knowledge in my daily practice? So let us explore a bit and see, you know, what are the major challenges that you, uh, as a palliative care physician, trying to uh, incorporate palliative care or delivering palliative care uh, would be likely to face and probably some of the ways in which you can overcome those. Now, this is a huge area what we're talking about. Organizing palliative care is not, I mean, it's not something which can be covered in one hour's time. So it's more like, you know, we might be able to get a, a basic idea about what is required and what uh, we should be expecting going forward. And um, you can you feel free to interrupt me uh, at any point of time in case um, you know some of these things are not making sense to you you can uh, you know sorry um, um, so so you can uh, interrupt and ask those questions and uh, we'll uh, continue uh, from there next slide next slide yeah okay so essentially, we are going to yeah go forward, uh, Raju. Yeah, okay, back. Yeah. So essentially, we are going to touch upon these topics, um, basically volunteering, collaborating, advocacy, and fundraising. I put it together because it's kind of uh, supplementing each other. You know, uh, you know, advocacy helps fundraising. Fundraising helps advocacy, and then uh, something which. Uh, uh, we have tried to include recently is uh, the, the, the morphine uh, related or opiate related some of the procedures and stuff like that. So next slide. So if you look at the definition of palliative care, this is something which you are all, all familiar with by now. Um, I'm not going through the entire thing, but essentially we know that it is about treating pain and other problems which are psychological, social, spiritual, physical, all of these. Now what is required to, to, to achieve this, you know, provide this kind of a care? It's obvious that you need an interdisciplinary approach because it, one single person or one group of people uh, may not be able to 
deliver all that is required for a patient and a family. If, if this needs to be effectively delivered, you're talking about a multidisciplinary team. And we also understand that the total pain that we are talking about is not just about the physical aspects, it involves all the other psychological, social, and spiritual aspects also. So from this context, we are talking about working with a much bigger team. Now, what does that team consist of? Um, next slide. Uh, just before that, if I would, sorry, next slide please. Um, yeah. So the question is, whose business is this? No, I understand yeah, palliative care is to be delivered to the people. Uh, as physicians, all of you are or would like to um, provide this kind of care, but primarily whose business is it? Now, we believe that palliative care is everyone's business. Now, I hope all of you would agree with me on this because unless we are clear about this part of it, that is palliative care is not just about the doctors and the nurses and the physiotherapists, then I don't have, as an engineer, I don't have a role to play here. And I have no right to be talking about palliative care to people like you who have been trained to deliver palliative care. So the first thing that we all of us should keep in mind is palliative care is not just about um, the, 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 the care being delivered by the healthcare professionals in terms of doctors, nurses, uh, paramedical uh, staff and all that, it, it is about everyone in this community. That includes you and me. Okay. Next slide. So who are the possible team members? Hold on. So these are typically doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, all these people are trained to handle um, these kind of situations um, with, with, with uh, patients and their families. But what we should also not forget is the next set of people, the volunteers and the caregivers. Now, that's the team that we're talking about. Essentially, anyone who can contribute in improving the quality of life for the patient and the family, they are part of your team. Now, that's not going to be easy, is it? It's going to be much more complicated now. Now, you just need to, I mean, so far we've been dealing with all these nurses, the pharmacists, and probably the social workers, and you know how complicated that itself is. And we are adding to the complication by involving all these other people, plus the volunteers and the caregivers. Now, Dr. Sunil said, you know, it will not be, palliative care will not be complete without volunteers. Um, now, there are places where palliative care is being offered without volunteers being involved, especially the developed world. But if you're looking at it from uh, the developing world or the third world, as they call it, you know, perspective, it's it's a huge strain on the existing system, existing uh, the medical system that we have in, in place. I, I, so it, probably the right word to use is the healthcare system. Now, this is already overburdened. And if we are going to ask for these additional services from the existing healthcare system, I don't think it is a practical uh, approach. Now, that is probably where, you know, in a third world setting, where the healthcare system is already overburdened, stressed to the limit, the volunteers, the community brings 
a huge makes a huge difference you know they bring in the probably the missing elements and the caregivers let us not forget that whatever we try to provide to a patient unless the caregivers around him or her in their family or around them are also involved none of this is going to be practically uh, you know implementable so so caregivers are part of a team to ensure that the right kind of uh, services delivered next slide please so hold on so we are familiar with these two levels the the macro level which means the institutions the hospitals the government machinery the facilities that we currently have in the country uh, that is something which even a kid is familiar with the macro level as far as healthcare uh, is is concerned now the next level is also something which we are all familiar with that is the family the immediate family now unless they are there you know it's so obvious right if i have a fever the per first person to give me care is not the doctor it would be probably my 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 mother my own mother or my wife or my kids i don't know whoever is there in my house living with me they might be the first first line of service providers and most often we overcome that situation with just that their help at the micro level now what is often not recognized is the level in between the macro and the micro level which we call it the mesoscope sir so, there is some disturbance from your end sir what kind of disturbance like some children are screaming oh it's from outside then just hold on let me see what i can do about it okay sir call the name of good is that better now uh, it's okay uh, yeah please continue okay it's better i believe sorry about this um so so it's the level in between which we call the meso level um one more clip please yeah now what does that mean that that is the that is the level that is the community what we're talking about and therein lies a huge opportunity that we are often not exploring enough so this is called the social capital which is essentially lying locked so to speak you know we have not explored enough of its potential even today now once you are able to identify the key to unlocking this this treasure box a whole lot of your problems get automatically solved you know so now the social capital is provided by each and every one in the society people like you and me plus everyone that you can think of like from the skilled unskilled laborers to the ias officers the uh, the engineers the the legal uh, experts the judges whoever we have, we can think of you know all these people are there who would like to be involved in this healthcare but they are not being allowed to they kept away what if we let them in the whole situation changes the the whole 
scenario changes. Now, that is where we are talking about this, the role of a volunteer. Now, the definition says it's a person who takes on a task or responsibility without being assigned, ordered, or told to do so. <coughs> and it also it also implies that there is no compensation. It is out of one's own pleasure and will that he or she is coming forward to take on this assignment. So there is no compensation, which is good, fine. I mean, half our problem is solved. If we are, if we are to compensate in terms of, you know, monetary compensation, if you look at compensating each and every volunteer for the time and the effort that they're putting in, that is going to be a huge challenge. Uh, we will not be able to afford it. But then is it so easy? Like I have 100 volunteers, all my problems are solved. No. Now that brings in another set of problems. So unless we are clear about what is involved, what it means to have a volunteer with you, working with you to solve this problem, you will not be able to, or you will not be in a situation to even utilize the 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 uh, the, the volunteering um, opportunity that is in front of you. So next, we'll just go through the story of K. N. Nair. K. N. Nair is 65 years old now. He retired from the army. He joined it at the age of 17. And then, go forward. His wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2002 when she was 45. Now, the cancer had already advanced to stage three. And by the time the doctors, I mean, by the time it was diagnosed, um, it was a stage where nothing much could be done as far as curative, uh, this thing is concerned. And she died eventually in November 2004. Now, imagine yourself in this position. What would you have done? There are so many ways of looking at this. Obviously, as a person who has gone, I mean, it is not stated here specifically, but um, K. Nair had taken his wife to almost all the major hospitals, all the leading oncologists over the, the course of those, you know, few years uh, since she started, uh, you know, showing symptoms pain and other difficulties and uh, and it is not that he did not go to a proper consultant or a physician that uh, the diagnosis was delayed but then once it was diagnosed it was a situation where nothing much could be done about uh, you know, on the treatment front Now, if I was in his position, I would have certainly felt very bad about it. I would have been angry at the system. I would definitely be angry at the doctors, the medical system, you know, including the nurses, the hospitals. And obviously, I would be reacting to that. And to make things worse, when she was finally identified with cancer. You know what the doctor told him? Can anyone guess what would have been the statement from the doctor's side? Anyone who can just guess? No comments? What is a typical 
reaction from an oncologist you know you're you're seeing that patient for the probably the first time and uh, it's stage three or four and uh, you know what would be the typical reaction from the doctor's side i think so, uh, yeah yeah usually the reflex response is what were you being all of this time exactly. why were you stepping at home absolutely thank you gaurav exactly and how does it make you feel if you were in dr nay's position how would that make you feel uh, that's no. a terrible statement to make first of all yeah so you are already under stress you are already feeling probably guilty and then this adds to the stress and the guilt and all those emotional things that you're going through now obviously you're you're fed with all this and your immediate reaction would be aggression <coughs> probably you may take up a legal battle you know against the the hospital and the doctor um, today that is all quite common right but doctor i mean k nair <laughs> chose something different he decided at that point you know by the time he had gone through all the medical textbooks and he was pretty clear that it was uh, it was a mistake from the doctors you know he was not advised or his wife was not advised to go through a pap smear test which was something which should have been done right at the beginning and that was never done now he decided i am not going to take it up take up a legal battle and fight for this but i would like to make sure that another person doesn't go through what i went through or my wife went through you know let me see what i can do to help others in need now there you can see a volunteer being born you have a volunteer now now why did i say the story next slide now can skip through that yeah yeah so why did i say the story you know it is important to know why a person is becoming a volunteer because unless we know the why why is he interested in volunteering for something like this we will not be able to you know help him contribute also now once we identify that <clears throat> things become much easier now what all can a person like ken nair do in palliative care of course sky is the limit it all depends on what that person's qualification or capabilities are you can look at all these listed areas like patient care advocacy fundraising clerical work whatever it is but it's also important to identify specific areas where that particular volunteer is capable of delivering something useful now if that person if the volunteer is trained as a nurse maybe you can get that person directly involved in patient care what if that patient is not but would like to still involve themselves in patient care still you have opportunities like it might be helping a nurse uh, perform his or her task like for example cleaning up a, a, a patient you know giving him a bath or you know supporting that uh, nurse or the or the um the support team with with uh, taking the medicines to them or you know packaging it or whatever it is now that is patient care of course you it goes without saying the kind of social support that could be offered and the, in on top of all that the advocacy and the fundraising potential <coughs> is huge that is something which each one of us you know could do in our own small way now 
a lot of our limitations in terms of manpower or resources as you uh, as we say could be overcome with volunteers being involved in this care so it's important to identify which specific area they are good at and where they can contribute and it's also important to earmark specific days and time of the day because what if we have 10 different volunteers and all 10 come on a Friday? And what if all the volunteers come from 5 to 7 in the evening? We may find it difficult to offer them something you know, to do, useful. Plus, it is also a, a strain on the doctor or the nurse also. You know, so it has to be it has to be clear, you know, when they are going to come, how they are going to, going to contribute. These are things which have to be very clear. Let us move to the next slide. So, as I said, volunteer management becomes a challenge in itself, you know. Now, you need to go ahead and we'll just skip through those some of those things here. So, you need to screen the volunteers because, you know, even though uh, you know, most of the volunteers are coming forward with a positive mindset. They they, they want to contribute um, in a positive manner. There might be situations when you might have to say no to some of the volunteers also. It depends on what their intentions are. You know, not everyone will have all the positive intentions. Now, You also need to keep on asking, you know, does this person have the necessary qualifications and the commitment to go through this? On top of all that, we also need them to go through a training process because if they're not properly trained in palliative care, if they don't understand what is it that they're dealing with, what they're doing you know, even though they might be imagining, the, the volunteer might imagine that he's doing something good and positive, it might be counterproductive as far as the patient is concerned. It might actually do more harm than good if that person, if the volunteer is not uh, properly trained. And even the word can sometimes, you know, cause a lot of trouble and confusion. Now, and of course, you need to properly supervise and evaluate them periodically. Can you move forward? So the critical questions are what makes them do it and what are they looking for? Because unless we identify that, we will not know what to offer them, which will keep them engaged, happy and contributing. So unless they get something out of it, because it's, we have to remember that it is not the money that they are after. And if you say that, okay, I can give you 100 rupees per hour, that might be the reason why they stop showing up. It would be insulting for them. <coughs> you might feel that okay, I can I can spare two thousand rupees per hour for a volunteer. The when I say thousand rupees, I am also saying that you know what you are doing is worth thousand rupees, which can be you know insulting in some in some cases at least. So we need to know what is it that makes them keep doing this and and you have to uh, you know keep on providing uh, something that is interesting for them and keep them engaged next now we move on to something it's even more important nowadays you might have heard of this word collaboration now this is specifically uh, in the case of palliative care, we, we, we already discussed about the teamwork that is required, the team which consists of all these professionals and the volunteers and the caregivers. So it's about working together as a team. All right. Now, today's situations have also changed. It has become even more challenging. 
And why do we collaborate? Next slide. People collaborate so that, you know, we have new ideas coming forward to solve problems that we are not able to solve individually or within our team. So we look at people or teams who can come together, bring in new ideas or expertise so that the productivity improves. Probably we could look at increased number of patients that we can attend to or the quality of care being improved or maybe other innovative things also which, which evolves. So today it's even more important because the scenario is changing. Next slide, please. Earlier, almost all the palliative care providers were, you know, they were NGOs working in specific areas. Like there would be an NGO in Trivandrum like Palium India, who might be the only uh, provider, palliative care service provider in Trivandrum. There could be another NGO in, in a place like uh, Kochi or Delhi, who might be the, the palliative care service provider in that region. But the scene has changed. You know, now we have a lot more NGOs, CBOs means community-based organizations, NGOs stand for non-government organizations. And of course, it is also part of the health system, the government health system in many states now. Now, which means that, you know, there are a lot more service providers. So it is not just about the professionals. It is about working with other organizations also. So unless we understand that we need to work in a collaborative manner, you know, it is and, and how to go about work. I mean, we are not being trained in collaborative working generally, you know, as an engineer, I was never trained to. It was only as part of the work that I did, you know, I learned a bit of collaborative working and stuff like that. So this is something which is very, very important, especially in the case of palliative care in the current scenario. Next slide, please. Now, I'll just give you an example. If Palium India were to offer services to the community, there would be a limitation, like maybe we would be able to attend to a few Send few patients, maybe hundreds of patients, or even a couple of thousand of patients, thousands of patients in Trivandrum area. But the need is not a few thousand patients. You know, the, the need is huge. The number of patients in Trivandrum alone would run into thousands of such patients, or even tens of thousands of patients. Now, how do I reach out to them? So there again, it is important that I work with entities, groups, organizations, which can further, you know, bring out or you know take the service to the community, make sure, making sure this reach out to a larger population. Now, when I say link centers, these are organizations or entities we are, we connect with, we work with. Like we, it could be an NGO, it could be even a government hospital. Like for example, the medical college hospital in Trivandrum has a palliative care OP running, you know, or patient unit running every day from one to four in the afternoon. And that is actually handled by us. The team from Palium India goes there and uh, offers this uh, service there, including the morphine that is uh, offered to the patients there. Now, what does that mean? An NGO, a, a public charitable trust like Palium India, working with a government medical college. It's a Herculean task. Even getting that relationship going, you know, the first tie-up itself is a challenge. And going forward at every stage, things, you know, new, new, new issues keep cropping up, which need to be attended, which need to be resolved. But then it is important to work with the medical college because they are the, 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 the probably the only service provider for a large majority of the population in, in a particular area because it's a government facility, it is accessible to a much larger number of people, uh, you know, the common man, I would say. So, so it is important 
that we work with these entities and for that we need to be prepared we need to know how to work with other such entities next slide again i'll just take you through an example sita i've changed the name she's a palliative care patient now she's the only earning member of her family now she had some kind of a growth uh, in a spinal cord or in that region there was a surgery after which she was paralyzed and for some period she was also bed bound i believe after that what happened was very interesting she was she was trained in making these jewelry you know some of the volunteers took the initiative and helped her uh, you know learn this art okay that was one part of it so you know she started making jewelry but then what do i do with the jewelry that is made how do i sell it that is a challenge now someone suggested okay you can do that uh, 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 you can sell it online you can sit at home and then do it online what does online mean for someone like sita she has not even seen a computer so there was another uh, youngster who came forward and said okay i can teach her how to use a computer okay fine she wanted to learn there was someone to teach her she learned how to use a computer does that solve the problem no she didn't have a computer at home so then we announced to the world that there is a patient who knows how to make jewelry who knows how to make this jewelry and wants to uh, you know use the internet to sell her stuff and for that she needs a computer so a well wisher comes forward and says okay i am willing to donate a laptop and the local cable guy offered the internet connection now she is online she has got a facebook account she makes the jewelry and sells it through facebook and she earns a living not just her own she is not just meeting her own expenses she is earning for the entire family which includes her parents as well and it doesn't end there she didn't have a proper a road to the, the the place where she was living her, her, her house was not uh, wheelchair friendly again the community got involved the local people stepped in they made sure that the road leading to a house was motorable and the panchayat stepped in they made sure that it was tarred or at least you know surfacing was done so that cars could reach a place the again the neighborhood they got in and, and and they made sure that at least the the house was wheelchair friendly at least some of the areas were wheelchair friendly so that she could uh, you know go about in her own house now all of this was made possible not just because of one doctor or one pallium india it was the panchayat getting involved it was the common man getting involved the neighborhood you know the the ngos all these people coming together and that made a lot of things possible for sita and to make sure that that whole family is able to survive next now that is the power of collaboration but we assume that collaboration is there because everyone wants to support that individual or wants to support someone in need and that is why all these people come together and that is the only reason why people work together then it is foolish i am a am a human being and i have my own selfish interests and you should remember that every person you and me included has their own specific needs specific interests selfish interests i may say if i may say so so unless we understand what each of these uh, uh, peop persons is not just individuals including organizations uh, are looking forward to from this engagement we will not be able to make an effective collaboration happen next slide please all this plus more what is that you also need a leader if there it is a leaderless activity 
things are going to go astray. Like for example, in Sita's case, there should be a leader who identifies that, okay, at this point of time, what is required for her is medical attention. At this point, it is not about the medical care. It is about, uh, you know, making sure that she gets a wheelchair on which she can be made mobile again. Now, how do I get about, go about doing it? Who to approach? Who all should get involved? You know, there should be someone who, who makes sure that all these entities, the individuals, work together towards this common objective. So a leader is also essential. Now, therein comes the next big question. Who is the leader and where is the leader? Next slide. Where does it start, the process of collaboration? It starts with me, I. Now, if you expect someone else to come in and solve these issues for you, make sure that you're going to be able to, uh, make sure that you are able to provide palliative care. You know? Just when you want to. Okay, I'm ready, I'm trained in palliative care. Now, give me the infrastructure. It is not going to happen. We need to make sure that each one of us, we take up that leadership. And that is why I mentioned I, that is, a, that is where it all begins. And it begins with a, a process of inquiry. It is about asking the right questions probably. Asking yourself, you know, why is it that this is important? What is it that the society needs? What is it that the community needs? What is the priority for uh, this particular institution that I'm working with? How do I bring this team together? Now, this, these kind of questions for which some of these questions may not have any direct answers initially, but it is important that that process of inquiry happens. Once that happens, you may need, you know, you automatically come to a situation where you start innovating. When I say innovating, with the limited resources, with the limited uh, maybe manpower or the money or whatever you have with you, you may be able to find innovative solutions and making things happen for the patient and the family. Now, once the innovation happens, that is going to inspire a whole lot of people around you. And once that inspiration happens, it, it is kind of a, can you just click once more? It creates a much larger impact in the society. Now, if you can, if you, if you can just think about our independent struggle, probably you can see all these things happening, you know, at different stages. There was an innovation in terms of non-violence movement, which you know made sure that the, the numbers, large number of people brought together, got together and made something possible, a reality, which was until then was thought improbable, impossible to that extent, you know. So so a lot of these things, what you're seeing today in palliative care is also. I would say there's a lot of innovation that has happened along the way and that has to keep happening in the field of palliative care because we are working with challenges. We are working in a situation, as I told earlier, uh, where the healthcare system is already burdened or overburdened and then we need to find innovative solutions to the challenges that we are facing. So once as an individual you are able to make an impact that affects the community and that in turn, you know, spreads to the whole society. Now, this is the ripple effect that we need to keep seeing so that palliative care reaches every nook and corner of this country. Shall we? So, go on. So what is the key to good collaborative working? Obviously, it is understanding what each of the other partners want. Like, for example, if I need to work with the government, the, the, the government medical college, 
I should understand what the principal in that medical college is looking forward to. I should be able to understand what the health head of department would be interested in having. I should also be probably uh, looking at, you know, how, how can this whole thing be interesting for the health secretary or whoever you're working with. So basically we need to understand what the need of the other partner is. And the only way we can do that to understand what the other person needs is by listening to them. Now, this is what we have been trained to do in palliative care. If you are, if you are supposed, to, <clears throat> sorry, if you are asked to deliver palliative care to a patient and a family, first it's about understanding what their needs are, and the only way out is by listening to them, and that is exactly what is required in these scenarios also. Shall we move on to the next slide? Now, advocacy is something which you and I, each one of us should be doing at every possible stage because I, I might be able to influence maybe three people in helping them understand what palliative care is, how it can be accessed, where it can be accessed. <clears throat> Now, it could be in a, in a train, during a term train journey. It could be while I'm talking to my superior in my office. It could be while I'm dealing with, I mean, uh, interacting with my friends. Every little bit helps because the concept of palliative care is unknown to a large majority of the society. And we know that, you know, unless people are aware of what it can do and what it really means, we'll not be able to offer the service uh, to anyone practically because the need also has to come from the people and unless they are made aware, it's not going to happen. So <clears throat> how do you make people aware of the need? The single solution is advocacy. So that is why it is very important. And next slide, please. It also influences the, the policy makers, the decision makers in the government bodies and other areas to, to help bring about the change, the, the awareness. So the focus areas would be, of course, the government bodies, if it's a panchayat or the, I don't know, the, the, um, the local uh, municipality or the corporation or the, the health department, whatever. It could be, it could be the, the press and other media because the, the power that the press holds is phenomenal. You can make mountains move if the press, the media takes it up. And today, what we should also not forget is the power of social media. Now, when I say media, <clears throat> we should also consider social media. And there are, you can see so many, so many uh, interesting examples where uh, the social media has made a huge difference in terms of awareness. Uh, the one that I can think about now is uh, the, the ice bucket challenge. I don't know how many of you have been following this. There was an ice bucket challenge uh, probably a couple of years back. Um, and what was it for? I think it was the ALS patients. Um, I don't know, but I think it was for the ALS patients. But every single celebrity joined it. It was a simple thing to do, but then that created the awareness made sure that the larger majority of the people, the population started talking about these kind of problems anyway. So we should not forget about the role of the social media. Similarly, the local residents association, people who are living around you, we should let them know that this is available. This is the kind of care that you can look at, especially you know if it is a end of life situation, what are the options that you have, you have in front of you? Um, schools, colleges, children, let's not forget them because they are the people who can actually spread this message to the next generation. And uh, maybe tomorrow might be a better, brighter future if we, we, we give enough attention to, to these institutions. Next. 
So overall, the benefits, change in attitude and behavior, change policies and practices, reform institutions, and gives the work a broader impact. Now, it also helps in fundraising. Why? Because unless the people are aware about the need for palliative care, we will not be able to raise enough funds to meet those requirements also. Now, it has both ways, like I said earlier. Advocacy leads to fundraising. I can give you a small example. You ask someone to contribute 100 rupees for a patient who is 70 years old and uh, may be bedridden. You ask the same person 100 rupees for a kid who is homeless and for his education, to fund his education. What do you think are the chances? I can guarantee you that the person would think of giving that 100 rupees to the kid or to, to, to support the kid rather than the 70 year old person because the basic outlook from a public perspective is that you know anyway that person is going to die there is no future so why should i waste my 100 rupees on this person rather i might spend this 100 rupees on this kid so that at least he has a future so unless the the need is uh, clear to the population to the people who are going to be the supporters you know we will find it difficult to raise the kind of funds and the, the financial support needed for uh, you know implementing these kind of uh, uh, what you call services next some things which we should understand fundraising is not about sales it is not selling why because here the donor and the, the organization or the individual who is raising the funds, they are both on the same side. They are not on two different sides. What are they trying to do? They are trying to find solutions for the problems that they are seeing in front of them. It is they're trying to solve the patient's problems, the family's problems. So it is about working together again, collaborating to make sure that an objective is met. So fundraising is about, it's not about money. It is about, you know, it's just a means to an end. You need the money to be able to do something so that it ultimately helps someone in distress. And we should also not forget that as a person, I would like to give to people directly. I don't want to give it to another organization or a middleman. Why should I? I will think of giving it to such organizations or people if I start seeing the work that they do and how it is benefiting the common man. Because I would like to spend my money directly on the patient, ensure that this reaches the end user. So it's about always about appealing to the emotions, you know. Like when I talk about the story of Preeta, sorry, story of Sita. It appeals to your emotions. You find it interesting. And once you find that story interesting, you might think of opening up your wallets and contributing to the cause. So it's not about asking people to give. Rather, it's about inspiring them to give. They should feel like contributing to the cause. And that is the funda. I would say in fundraising. Next. And some of the things that you should do and should not do as far as fundraising is concerned, like I told you, it is always about storytelling because nothing more, I mean, nothing works like storytelling. And it should be real life stories where, where you, which you have been involved in where you know what impact has it has made to people, a patient, or what is the gap that you're seeing. The real life stories are worth telling and people understand these stories better. They understand the need better through stories. Need to be honest, it's not about 
fooling them into donating. No, it is about making sure that they understand why they are giving that contribution, where it is going to be used, who is going to be benefited, and that information also has to get back to those people who are contributing to this. Share your problems as well as your success. You know, everyone knows it's not like, you know, you start off with something, you know, you only have successes along your way. All of us have had our own share of failures too, and problems that we're facing, which we don't have a solution to. So it's important to also share our problems as well as our successes. <clears throat> and of course, you should know whom to ask, how much to ask for, and when to ask. And again, being a good listener helps because the donor will ultimately tell you what he wants to give at some point of time or the other. Next. The opportunities are plenty as far as fundraising is concerned. I'm just listing down a couple of, a few of these things, but this is not, this list is not exhaustive. You can add to this, but what you should understand is each one of these, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the possibilities comes with its own uh, challenges and, and you need to have certain capabilities to be able to address it fully. Like for example, if it's organizing an event for raising funds, it is about organizing even, even management skills or getting people together, all those things. If it is uh, accessing government grants or funding agencies, it's about project writing, budgeting, presentation skills. If it is about running a campaigning campaign on social media, again, it's about designing that whole uh, the campaign. It is about organizing this, you know, how to use the social media or other media, whatever it is. So those kind of things are important. So pick and choose, identify what would work best for you and stick to that. Next. So I think we have covered all that. And do I have five more minutes? Um, um, Raju? Yes, sir. You can take Okay. So then uh, can you put on the next set of slides? We'll just briefly go through this um, um, the opioid. Yeah. No. The other thing that most, uh, most doctors keep on asking is how do I get access to morphine? I know that, you know, this is essential. The opioids are essential for managing pain, but I don't have access to them. How do I ensure that I have access to um, these, uh, these opioids? Now, a lot of things have changed over the last few years. And you might all be aware that, you know, 2014, there was one major, um, what do you call it? a change that happened with the NDP Act. Now, NDPS stands for Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act. Uh, and this was um, an act which was, which was in force for uh, a few decades. And in 2014, uh, this was changed. And some of the things which we need to know about it, of course, it's, it's not again comprehensive, but I can give you, share a link with you, or even Raju, probably you could share that, uh, uh, the other attachment that I forwarded it to you. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive document. It's a PDF file, which um, you know, gives all the details about how, how to get an RMI certification and uh, what is to be done in terms of stocking morphine, dispensing in, and all those things. So <clears throat> we just go through the basic stuff. And uh, as you can see, the 85 Act, <clears throat> the, the amendment in 85 said that the state governments have the power to change the rules as per their needs in each state, which meant that some of the states like Kerala went ahead and made those changes which made sure that the opioids were more uh, available to the, the medical professionals <coughs> in Kerala. But then <coughs> it was not a national uh, thing, you know, it was not, a, uh, it was not something which, uh, 
which could be enforced by the central government. So each state had different rules. And um, this was changed in 2014 with uh, the amendment which came about. And now the state governments no longer uh, have a legislative power. They are just asked to implement the, 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 uh, the NDPS Act um, and uh, essentially in respect to the uh, essential narcotic drugs. Next. So, next. Uh, sorry, previous one. I think you went to the end. Previous. Okay, next one. Sorry. So now um, the change, what it means is that, you know, you need to be a recognized medical institution to be able to stock and dispense opioids, the, the essentially uh, morphine-related uh, drugs. Now, what does that mean? The recognized medical institution means it is recognized by the, uh, the government and how do you do that? There is a, a process involved. Uh, you need to apply. And for that application to be made, you should also have at least one doctor who has undergone uh, uh, um, a training program on the use of these opioids, which, which includes all these training programs that you are currently having. So once you have a certification there, that makes it eligible for you to apply on behalf of the institution or the organization to, 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 to apply, you need at least one doctor with this kind of a certification. And once the RMI status is given, it is valid for three years and it is renewable every three years. So it has taken away a lot of other agencies from the picture. Um, uh, you just, uh, I mean, the excise department and these all these import export permit and all those things have been done away with. But of course, you need to ensure certain other things which um, are also important in terms of stocking this, you know, how you store it, where you store it, um, how it should be dispensed and all those things. Next slide, please. Um, this again can be shared with the team, you know, where they can find uh, all these details. Um, as far as the forms are uh, concerned, uh, you know, for, for applying for this, you know, that is that is already available on our website. And it's, uh, it's, it normally takes a few months, uh, that's it, to, to get it. Uh, unless, of course, there is uh, some major, uh, you know, uh, what you call roadblock, uh, unseen roadblocks, yeah. So it is essentially for medical and scientific use that this, this amendment um, has, uh, you know, uh, made it simpler. Uh, so it's only about providing it to the medical institutions, making sure that it is available for the needy, the patients uh, who, who require these kind of medicines and not available in, and, and also ensure that it is not available in all these pharmacy outlets across the country or even the, the medical shops as we call it, you know. So it's not for that. Next one. And the, the medicines include morphine, fentanyl, methadone, all these things. So it's all covered under one, um, what do you call it? It's, it's not a license actually. Uh, RMI is a, a, a kind of a recognition given. Next one. So what is important to know that if someone says that, you know, in this state, uh, you know, it is not applicable, they are wrong. It is the entire country. It is one single law now and you can fight for it. Say that this is something which you want to have in your state, in your region, in your district. And the government has to make sure that the, the, the laws are changed so that it is available there. Next. So this is what we just mentioned. You know, you need to have a doctor with training in palliative care uh, and essential, I mean, use of these essential narcotic drugs, the opioids, to, to, uh, to get this uh, recognition from the drugs controller. Um, 
and proper documentation and monitoring. And again, that is what I mentioned you know, earlier. There, there is one document which gives complete, uh, what you call step-by-step -step procedures and uh, uh, you know, all the details pertaining to, to, uh, to uh, you know, stocking and dispensing of these morphines, uh, even availing it, including the RMI registration and all those things. So that is also something which uh, I believe Raju will be able to share with all of you. Uh, and uh, all these information are also available on our uh, website, as I said earlier. And remember, the excise department is no longer involved in the process anywhere in the country. It is just the truck controller. And that is it. Yes, um, Raju, I think uh, we have covered most of it. You can uh, share those that uh, the particular uh, document which is attached. Um, any any specific questions? I think we have taken five minutes more than what was given to me. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Vinod. Uh, we can have some quick questions. Uh, yeah, question uh, regarding the uh, staffing of a palliative care uh, department or an organization, other than doctors and nurses, like, is there any criteria you need to have n number of doctors or so many nurse staff or so many of the other administrative support staff? Is there a, what is, called, like, is there any rule bound thing? To the best of my knowledge, no, there is nothing specific. Um, even, even as a single doctor, you can provide palliative care. But you will be the only limitation would be with what all you can provide, you know. And uh, the same applies to uh, a nurse if if she is properly uh, trained in palliative care. She also can give provide palliative care, except for you know dispensing medicines or you know the prescription and all those things so it is not that uh, you you need to have these many people with these many qualifications to be able to start a palliative care center no but definitely it helps there are um, there are minimum um, uh, you know guidelines or criteria that uh, we would like to recommend you know as uh, the palliative care community has put forward uh, but it is not something which is binding. It's, it's good to have kind of thing. What do you like to add to this? I mean, you might have something to share, I believe. Um, and there are no criteria in uh, Kerala itself. There are many palliative care centers which uh, works uh, without a full-time doctor. But there are some desirable criteria which. Uh, was developed by uh, palliative care community in India and which was published in Indian Journal of Palliative Care. Uh, so those are considered as uh, some desirable criteria, essential criteria for uh, starting a palliative care unit. So uh, there should be a doctor, uh, nurses, there should be a regular team meeting, there should be uh, provision for strong opioids. So there are some criteria like that. So which can be uh, Downloaded, or we can send you. So it's mostly good to have kind of a list. It's not something which uh, it's enforceable or. Doctor Anjika. Yes, doctor. Uh, so. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I wanted to share our experience uh, at uh, CRI Dehradun of uh, starting palliative care service, separate building cancer research institute where we have the surgical oncology, medical, radiation, uh, uh, hemato oncology, and allied nuclear medicine, all these services. So uh, I wanted to share my experience about uh, starting the palliative care services here. So we have uh, many doctors who are in their respective department. 
departments with surgical ward radiation ward medical oncology ward separate opd okay. and uh, uh, for the same general opd and private so uh, we are a, a 200 bedded uh, cancer institute and we have around 250 to 300 opd per day so we wanted to plan palliative care services here so with the help of uh, aims delhi we two doctors and two nurses took 14 months training uh, in palliative care and and uh, we uh, thought they could be the core uh, team members of palliative uh, care services here uh, unfortunately we don't have dedicated palliative care physician or doctor uh, uh, you know part of this team so it is the people who are continuing to be oncologist who in their part time are uh, delivering uh, are also the palliative care core uh, member team then we have uh, Uh, over time uh, some of our nurses have taken iapc i think around uh, 10 to 11 nurses in and shiga we can't hear you in and shiga we can't hear you Uh, I think uh, uh, anybody else uh, want to ask anything? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. one more thing. I just wanted to regarding the volunteers. So even if we have ten or fifteen people who are volunteering, and other than themselves being actually. that they're contributing in some small way uh, for the society or for the people who are sick and who need some care so uh, other than that uh, there's no question of uh, giving any sort of monetary assistance to them uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, can any organization means supposing organization which is not registered as a palliative care service provider so what kind of like usually uh, give out sort of a person who has served for 6 months who is taking part in activities for 6 months or a year and like sort of uh, certificates of so appreciation or like if they have programs and so forth like one forward these people and sort of appreciation that these people were active around the year and okay uh, i think we lost him again um garo okay. are you able to hear me Am yes so yes uh, i am able your question is is there some way of uh, encouraging encouraging them to yeah, do more exactly. of the volunteering yeah. work right yes yeah. your idea is very good in fact uh, that is something which uh, most of these volunteers would love to have at some kind of a recognition it could be <clears throat> in terms of a, a certificate if they have undergone a, a, a training program it could be a certificate uh, you know uh, mentioning that they have uh, volunteered during this period helped us provide care to these many patients those kind of a certificate would definitely be helpful um now it could also be even a, a id card you know which they can wear Uh, if you if you feel that this person has contributed substantially over a period of uh, say one year or so, and uh, you would like to give a recognition for that, if there is something like a uh, something which you, they can clip on to their uh, uh, you know you know shirt, um, they would they would most of most often you find that they're proud to wear those things, you know, announcing to the world that they, yes, I am I am a palliative care uh, provider. So 
you are absolutely right gaurav there are so many other ways other than mont uh, uh, in which you can encourage them to keep contributing uh, for all those so generally sugar ka tenant baat karenge yeah so one more thing was that yeah so uh, just as a continuation of that uh, uh, many of these people would be young people or middle aged people and who would be working in certain offices and organization so i think it would be a, a sort of a uh, some sort of a plus point for them as part of the corporate social responsibility program whereby they can actually like sort of add it to their own uh, added extra curriculars or something which they can add to the bio data or the resume that they were as social workers or sort of they help the society in this and this manner so i think they can get some sort of appreciation from their own respective companies or when they do apply for further job opportunities i think that, that possibly could be one thing which could sort of be an incentive for them i'm not sure how this works out but because i don't know how the corporate social responsibility thing works in an individual level. so maybe that could be just one thing it possibly could sort of yeah uh, we in sort of a bit look at it yeah absolutely gaurav you are right i mean uh, so many uh, companies encourage these kind of activities uh, and they sometimes even support them with uh, uh, so it is like this um, what do you call um, contributory programs like uh, you you put in um, uh, say you want to contribute a, a one hour effort you know the company compensates with with, with with another hour or uh, you know you you provide uh, um, uh, you know 100 rupees uh, to co- contribute to this cause the company uh, contributes another 100 so these kind of uh, mechanisms are already in place in many companies uh, but um, uh, uh, i one thing i would like to highlight here is that it's not just about youngsters uh, in the in the colleges and uh, the uh, um, people are working in the private sector or are the employed uh, crowd who might be volunteering you know there are a lot of people who are post retirement they would like to come forward and uh, do something meaningful with their lives uh, contribute something to the society work with these kind of ngos so that is a huge uh, uh, resource pool that we have access to because the kind of experience that these people bring in uh, because they today 60 years is not such a you know they they say now it is the new uh, what you call the middle age so you could actually look at that crowd also i am not saying you know you should only limit to those uh, the, the, that set of people but uh, yeah we, we should be open to uh, these college students or even school students plus these employees plus the retired people anyone who is willing to come forward and pitch in and and contribute uh we should not let them go okay uh, thank you minot uh, i think uh, dr anshika we lost you in between and you can continue what what you were talking uh, i'm so sorry uh, for that uh, i am i i hope i'm audible this time yes, yes. let me be very 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 brief what i wanted to share because today's session was you know starting palliative care services so in uh, 2006 late we started palliative care services here at CRI Dehradun so i wanted to share some of the problems you know because it's a medical college so uh, funds are very limited so mci uh, medical council of india does not uh, it's not necessary to have a palliative care services department for mbbs training or pg training so allocating funds separately for you know uh, faculty or uh, staff for palliative care services is not uh, you know people don't want uh, the administration is not motivated enough so over the past 3 years we have kept our level of motivation high amongst the team and we keep uh, advocacy we keep high level of advocacy within the uh, uh, department within the institute within the medical college you know to continue the palliative care services we know that we are not going to get separate uh, a pp people who are being paid and to be in the uh, services of palliative care so we have not been discouraged by that and we continue 
so i just wanted to share with everybody in the group all the people who have taken the training this time that don't wait for any uh, uh, services to be created don't wait for anything else just start the opd start the ipd palliative care services and eventually uh, you can come up to a, a proper department or proper services in your institute you have to uh, come out and just start the services wherever you are thank you anshu for sharing that um so i think anshu has a question or comment dr anshu yes sir uh, good evening everyone uh, as discussed that dr gaurav told us uh, like uh, some of us are working in corporate sector like i'm working in uh, uh, one uh, health setup center in uh, novoku vistas which uh, company name is and in which uh, uh, when we joined here uh, in palliative care this is the uh, 18th class of us and uh, in the starting we we are having uh, like uh, two members are here in this palliative care one is uh, me and uh, my cmo is also here dr abhishek pandey so together we uh, learn here a lot of things and uh, we uh, just uh, ansika ma'am also told just said so ki uh, you can start the right now so uh, may, maybe uh, from next week or uh, after that uh, we uh, will start that uh, like palliative care services uh, it will be uh, like uh, uh, in a, like two or three people are here only that who receive treatment and after that uh, some of them are uh, like diabetic food some of them are like cancer patient so uh, uh, it is very uh so it is a uh, very helpful for us that uh, we can uh, now start in, uh, our uh, services in our area and uh, we are here uh, uh, around uh, 15000 uh, uh, people in this area so we will start soon and we will uh, communicate you and it is very helpful really helpful for us like uh, uh, before that we are knowing that to uh, in and all uh, that uh, medicines are using but uh, exactly the dose and exactly the side effects timing uh, we are not confident at that time but now i think so we are confident and uh, we will start soon in the communication and it is very helpful for us so thank you a lot for the creating for team thank you um, also and uh, sir thank you sir all Uh, all the best, uh, Dr. Anshu, uh, for the new center. And uh, if you have any uh, issues or problems, uh, you can always approach us. Uh, we will be with you. Yeah, sure, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that, Anshu and Anshika. Uh, I think um, we will. Uh, now stop the uh, question questions and uh, we will move on to the uh, feedback uh, in which uh, we would like to hear from you uh, what all went well and uh, what are the areas you think uh, we need to improve um, so we can uh, have a more uh, better uh, echo from the next time onwards Good evening, everybody, sir. I'm Dr. Mohan from Trichy, Tamil Nadu. Thank you for Pallium for giving a chance to learn the Palliative Care. Previously, I am not exposed to this type of training. Thank you for Pallium. I'm learning the Pallium Palliative Care for the past 15 weeks. I learned the basic concept of Palliative Care, especially the approaches, symptom analysis, and the care total pain care these are the some of the important points i have learned thank you palium time for learning the palliative care is very limited within the limited time we expose uh, all of the trainees to a maximum extent thank you palium thank you sir uh, anybody else sir do you have any suggestion to say sir mohan sir okay in the mic suggestion may be in the presentations well in advance given to the students they can go through before attending the class contact classes or the 
online graduate classes well in advance if you post one previous week you can go through the slides you can prepare for discussion also it will be helpful to the participants okay uh, thank you thank we will you. try to do that thank you sir and uh, dr nice. it's a nice team work sir um, we are we are going to miss you from next to wednesday huh. we are also going to miss you dr suraj please unmute yourself and speak yes hello uh, good evening sir uh, uh, it was a nice experience for me uh, it has been changed my view of uh, attending patients uh, actually we are uh, here having a physiotherapy department we are uh, most of the patients are from uh, poor background and most of them are palliative patients so we try to uh, i actually by uh, attending this course uh, my view of uh, talking with them and uh, knowing about their problems other than the disease so it helped me a lot to understand that and it changed my view of attending the patients and to talk with them and to counsel them thank you very much sir thank you dr suraj kumar and um, uh, it is very important to uh learn or know more about uh, patients uh, psychosocial issues uh, and uh, it is as equal to uh, under, uh, is as equal to understand about the disease and its process so um, we are as we are looking in the uh, for total care yes. so do you have any suggestion sir uh, no it was a nice experience for me so everyone everything went very perfect sir uh, for me it's uh, good okay, okay. Uh, yeah. thank you dr suraj uh, dr patma i do it on an opd setup so i i like that so psychosocial issues very nicely and i learned a lot how to counsel them and how to do with them that was the most interesting part that i learned it and i have changed my things in this course itself i saw two more patients and it was fantastic thank you for giving me a chance thank you Dr. Anjika, uh, ma'am, can you unmute from your end and speak? Yes. So I want to thank everybody for uh, such a wonderful, uh, you know, few weeks, and uh, uh, everybody participated so well in the discussions and case presentations. Uh, I'm very thankful to Pallium India for you know including me in these sessions. Thank you. Uh, thank you ma'am uh, do you have any suggestions ma'am ah uh, uh, ma'am we can't hear properly ma'am your voice is only one suggestion uh, because uh, you know it could have been more time for is it audible now yeah yeah am i better audible yes yes so because of the uh, type of group we had so i feel there could have been more time for a discussion uh, uh, with the faculty uh, uh, amongst the group and the faculty so maybe that time could have been increased that, that's the only suggestion i have okay thank you dr gaurav uh, yes sir uh, i think uh, after this uh, course i think I'll view each patient now differently, and management at all levels will change. I think I don't know any obstruction patient or pain patient or patient with wound which will manage in the same way. So I think uh, there is no single point which I can say which is not going to be affected. So every patient has been benefiting since we started of this course, and uh, I think uh, it's, 
I've still got a lot to learn. I think I have to go back to these notes and these video sessions again, time and again, whenever I feel that you should recap. So it's a good thing we have this on YouTube. So in cases where I feel that I need to recheck, uh, we already have the book with ourselves and the materials. So, and uh, regarding the session, I think, uh, uh, suggestion, sorry. I think everything went very well. And uh, one and a half hours is uh, decent enough. Uh, but all we need to do is just make a good use of it. And uh, only one thing is not a suggestion actually to the team. It's actually to the participants. Like we have a WhatsApp group and we even have an online discussion that we're having after the classes. And even if they ask stupid questions, it might seem stupid. We all were stupid at one point. So even if they ask any question, no matter how silly they might seem and how insignificant or how small they may seem, but I think they should ask something or the other. Uh, so it will help them only, it will help the group as a whole. That is the only suggestion for the others. I don't think I can suggest any new thing to you. I think this went fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav. <coughs> Dr. Shoba. Dr. Anshu? Yes, Doctor. Dr. Anshu? Yes, sir. What's uh, your feedback on these sessions? Yes, sir. Uh, my experience was very nice. And uh, I learned so many things here. As uh, uh, one and a half, uh, half hour is uh, for uh, students like participants learning like me. We are a uh, learner and it is our starting uh, points. So one and a half hour is not uh, like uh, enough for me. And uh, uh, but uh, what I learned here is absolutely very correct manner and uh, like uh, I will learn about the pain management that was uh, uh, exceptional thing for me and also that wound care management because uh, we are facing in this setup in uh, these two things we are facing in this setup that uh, diabetic wound care management or we can say access management and also uh, that uh, after the chemotherapy radiation therapy uh, that uh, uh, palliative care in this area we need. So uh, I will apply and uh, I will uh, um, follow these all suggestions that are given by you both and also Anshika ma'am and Gauravi. So thankful for the echo and palliative care. Thank you, Dr. Anshu. And um, uh, as I told you before, we are going to miss you all. Um, so um, before closing this session, I would uh, like to thank uh, all of you for your active participation uh, in this uh, echo session. And uh, I would especially like to thank um, and Dr. Anshiga and Dr. Gaurav for being more interactive and um, all of you have been uh, very helpful in learning uh, even we learned from each of you and uh, that was uh, an experience for all of us um, and I, I would like to thank all the faculties uh, who has uh, uh, who has been involved uh, for this echo session um, and uh, there was a person uh, who was uh, managing the technical issues behind uh, this echo session and you have not seen Krishna please come here so uh, he was the person who was involved in the technical aspects this is uh, Mr. Vishnu who is our uh, technical um, manager uh, so thank you Vishnu and uh, I would also like to thank uh, Rajar uh, for being an active coordinator for all these sessions and uh, she took pain to organize all of these uh, sessions 
calling faculties, participants, and uh, managing so many other things. So thank you, Rajalakshmi. Yes, and a special heartfelt thank to our facilitator, Dr. Sunil Kumar. He has been very instrumental towards this program. Uh, so he, I always used to call him and say, sir, what to do next, what to do next? And he will smile and say, we will see something, we will do something, don't worry. So thank you, sir, for being with us throughout. And a special thanks to all our participants. Stay with us. I think you know our number and mail ID. So if there is anything troubling you or if you want to share, please do write to, write to us. Uh, I hope we were clear throughout. So thank you all for joining in. We really want to miss you. So I have given that feedback and after this we will be having a post test too. So I will be sending the link of both uh, today itself. So please do do it. If anything more, you can write to us. So thank you, uh, Binod sir, for joining uh, joining today's session and taking a class for us. Thank you, and uh, thank you uh, to the entire group of people here, all doctors. Uh, it has been it has been a great uh, uh, learning experience for me also. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for your active participation, and thanks, uh, Raju and. Dr. Sunil, for uh, you know, giving me this opportunity to interact with this this crowd. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So we are logging it for today, and uh, we hope to see you somewhere uh, someday. <laughs> Have a blessed day, sir. We ahead. Bye.